Today, we are talking options, options, options. Have the pleasure of a three-person conversation with two guests, Imran Laka, founder and CEO of Options Insight, and Ming Zhao, options trader, very well known on Twitter and the founder of a, a startup in options. Ming and Imran, welcome to Forward Guidance. Great to be here. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, let's just quickly hear a little bit about your backgrounds. How did you guys get into options? Imran, how about you go first? Uh, okay. Uh, I've been an options trader for about 20 years. Started my career in traditional finance um, at some of the big banks. So I was at Credit Suisse, uh, Merrill Lynch, which, which became Bank of America. Then at Citibank, where I ended up running um, the European options desks. Spent a very short time on the buy side. And now I run my own training firm where I teach the masses to trade options. Mm. And uh, Ming, you uh, were t tell us about your background. You were in the hedge fund world. How did you sort of get the, the options bug? Well, I guess I've just always been a nerd, you know, <laughs> did a lot of math competitions as a kid. And uh, then, uh, you know, kind of was thought that linear was a little bit boring and, you know, decided wanted some more juice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, basically, you know, there's also a lot more kind of problems, I would say, or things to work on as an entrepreneur in the option space. So that's kind of how. Yeah. So, uh, Ming, I think you've got some thoughts about how options started, sort of the history of options. Can you tell us a little bit about how traditional markets invented options uh, in the first place? And then how did it go from something that was sort of in the hinterlands of finance to something that now is so mainstream and a lot of retail traders as well as institutional traders are using? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, options have actually been around for, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years, at least the conception of them. Um, the idea that, you know, you can have some sort of insurance on some market risk, like even in the earlier days when people were just, you know, let's call it pre-money, even when people were just trading back and forth. Um the idea that like, hey, if there's a shortage, you know, we can uh, we can kind of work our way ahead of time and guarantee that we can get, you know, enough at a certain value or price, whatever that means. Um, and so they've been kind of the idea of, you know, options and what it means in terms of the real risk has been around for a long time. Uh, but what happened, I think, in kind of the late like 1970s, um, when you know CB the CBOT first kind of came about was uh, at that point um, you know there was uh, there was also kind of a, a massive exodus from like physics and math just because jobs were kind of you know Fermi Labs was closing down and all that um, and so you have all of these people inventing derivatives market and making like a really big stir out of derivatives um, and then especially so it was like all the traders were kind of you know, nerds on Wall Street now. And then uh, it's like they go through these training programs and then, you know, who do they look up to or who's like, you know, the golden standard when they go through their training? It's basically Black Scholes and all of like the academic side. And so um, I would say, uh, you know, every market like hedging has been around for a long time, the use cases of options for hedging. Um, but it really became popularized when it became a spectator sport or a speculator sport. Um, and that kind of that happened when there were a lot more speculative traders in the market, a lot more like, you know, rise of buy side. Um, and then all of those people kind of went through these uh, these academic programs, if you're going to be an options trader. Um, and so therefore kind of kind of using like, you know, people say like, and like Nassim Taleb has arguments all the time about how, hey, Black and Scholes and Mer Merton didn't actually invent, you know, this equation. And uh Sure, they might not have, but they made a massive contribution to the options page, which is basically marketing it to all the folks of traders that ended up on the street. Right. And, and Imran, so Ming sort of took us to the year 2000, which is about when you entered the industry. I, I think I understand that in the dot com boom, a lot of people retail were using call options to get exposure to their sorts of stocks that they like. And that's the thing about options that we can talk about. If I want to buy Apple and I uh, have $170, I could buy one share of Apple, but I could also own a call option struck at 170 the right to buy 100 Apple shares at 100 And I get the difference if it goes up. And that trades at about $8. I was just looking up, I, I believe, in the uh, February 18th expiry. So it's a way to get leverage to something, but you don't have to necessarily borrow money. So if you are long an option, 
your your short your long convexity, the chance to make a lot a lot of money. Um, and but worst case, your position is going to go to zero. If you're short an option, you can lose a lot more than 100%. So that's just just a little bit of primer for people who might not be familiar with options. But Imran, the year is 2000. You just entered the industry. What did the options industry look like at that point in time? And how have you seen it evolve uh, until now? Wow. I mean, you're taking me back <laughs> like 20 years now. Um, you know, it, it, it was active. You're right. You know, I, I remember my internship was at um, UBS uh, on the FX desk, FX spot. And just as, as Ming said, that was so boring. Like the linear stuff was so boring. It just didn't excite me because I was much more about the maths and, and, and the multi-dimensional aspect of trading where you get, you, you have the dimension of time and you have the dimension of volatility and it just made it far more interesting. So I spent a bit of time on the FX op options desk and all of those guys were like saying, what are you doing in FX? You, you're a young kid, you want to trade options, go to equities because that's where it's booming, right? Because it was we were in the middle of the tech bubble. Um, so then I go to the, the equities and then the tech bubble collapses. <laughs> right? um, that's good for volatility, right? Yeah, but you know, they're not going to let me, I don't really know what I'm doing when I'm going in three months in, right? So um, so there was clearly opportunities there and some of the some of the rock star option traders there were making big money and trading gamma and I was like, what the hell does that mean? And, and it was it was super fun and interesting to see. Um, I think the biggest thing is like that's happened over the, those two decades is just like the kind of the way institutions have evolved and adopted systematic volatility selling as such a core part of what they do to enhance yield. And that's been a function of interest rates going to zero, basically, right? So you had back then there were some interest rates, right? But now as rates have just trended lower and lower and lower over two decades, where you can't get anything from yield, so you have to go and sell premium. That's the way you get yield, right? And so all of this financial engineering that's happened over the over time has ended up finding more and more funky ways to sell volatility, basically, right? And and I think that's that's really how I, I've seen it play out over those over those twenty odd years. Um, and then liquidity's grown massively as well in options, right? So retail guys are doing more and more. Um, liquidity is there. The amount of intraday option trading that goes on now is just obscene. Um, uh, and people are starting to understand these nonlinear products. And, and like you said, the, the leverage you can get and the opportunity set you have in trading these things it, it is very attractive for, for a lot of retail traders. Yeah. So you talked about selling volatility. I think of sort of car insurance when you insure your car net net it costs money on average you're going to spend more in car insurance than the average person is going to receive uh, 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 if they if they end up crashing their car that's how insurance companies make money so selling volatility is you know an on general an, 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 uh, an absolute return positive strategy because you pay for you pay for that convexity so that's the way that's the way people were generating yield but uh, Setting aside the, the structural selling of volatility that we've seen over the past 20 years, talk to us about uh, people buying volatility. Uh, either of you, uh, Ming or Aaron, what, what does a world where people are buying way more options, not just calls on the index, SPY, QQQ, but in particular single stock options, how does that uh, change the landscape and how does that alter the, the risk and rewards uh, uh, that, that traders and investors uh, have access to? Yeah, so let's go from 2000 to 2021, I guess, um, and talk about, I guess, GameStop and what happened there. That's kind of the classic example of what happens when all of a sudden people are buying way more volatility. Um, so what happens when we, we can kind of bucket two groups in the market. So let's call it retail and speculators and kind of just general like buy side. Um, and then market makers, which are, you know, theoretically supposed to be neutral, etc. So two parts of the market, right? So when you have the buy side buying a lot more, um, you know, let, let's say calls for simplicity, um, as that happened with AMC and GME, um, what happens is the market maker on the other side is is going to be obviously taking the other side, so, so selling, uh, and then they're going to be delta hedging. And so what that means is um, when when you're when you're selling calls, then you're going to you're going to basically buy uh, the underlying stock. And then as the market keeps rallying, you're going to keep buying more to stay, you know, to keep the, the delta flat. And so what happens is you kind of get this like vicious, like self-reinforcing or reflexive loop 
um, where things just get bid up more and more. And there's kind of this, this reflexivity is like baked into the market structure itself. Um, and so what happens really is like you have the small market, uh, let's call it options, much smaller than equities. Um, and you have this like tail wagging the dog, basically, where, you know, activity that's happening here, maybe like, like leading indicators um, and affecting a market that's much bigger because of these um, that that bridge between the two is the market maker delta hedging. Yeah, no, I mean on the gamma squeeze thing, I, I think the yeah the, the only thing I'd add to what Ying was saying, Ming sorry Ming was saying, um, is that you know you've got this Vanner effect as well, where you've got a load of buyers of options which take the implied vol of options higher, and an out of the money option that has a vol getting jacked up, the delta of that option increases, which makes you need to buy even more stock. So the reflexivity is coming from not only the market maker hedging the delta and gamma of the option, but as the demand for those options goes up and the vol goes up, that makes you need to buy even more delta. So it becomes a bit of a vicious spiral, right? Um, and it's also because they're so coordinated in the way they do this, right? Like the retail guys now use social media forums and they go, this is the stock we like, let's all buy some today, right? And they all buy like a grand worth of options and it's like all of a sudden you've got this massive order coming in options that normally 20 years ago, you'd need some big hedge fund to decide to buy these options. But now you've just got like, God knows how many little retail traders all buying it at the same time. And because one of the things, like if it was done over a long period of time in small clips, the market could digest it easier. But because it's so coordinated via social media, I think that's what's really empowered the retail and made it feel like a much more important force on the market and, and made it hard for those market makers to actually uh, digest and recycle the risk as they maybe would have been able to do previously. Yeah, I think key in those gamma squeezes are they're buying short dated options, right? So they're, they're paying, it's very cheap because they're only getting that exposure for two, three, two, or even one uh, week. I want to talk about how do you go about putting on an options trade? Is is this sort of seed idea of, of delta view in the stock? I think Apple's going to go up. I think Apple's going to go down. Or is it more a, a volatility uh, view? You know, Ming, you've posted some great threads on Twitter about just your journey of, of getting into an option, buying it, holding it, maybe rolling it, and then ultimately selling it. Uh, can you just Go about get go about your strategy and sort of the uh, the the do's and don'ts of, of of investing in options. Sure, I think there are many ways, many good reasons to buy options. So, um, as you said, like one could be you know I think I have a certain view about a certain stock or a certain index, and it's different from what the market is pricing in, and I literally want that directionality risk. Like I want I want to go. I think you know. Something is at something's at 100 today. I think it should be 130. Um, you know, I think it could be even higher than 130. I just want to buy a call because why go linear when you can, you know, make a lot more profit if you're correct. Um, so that's definitely like one good reason. Um, and as you said, a lot of vol plays are another good reason. If you're like, hey, you know, I think volatility is cheap right now relative to historical, and I think there's going to be a mean reversion, then I'm I'm going to put on a spread. Um, and so there's there's a lot of good reasons. There's a lot of good kind of inefficiency opportunities for you to uh, that that options lend themselves well to um, you know taking advantage of. Um, that said, also uh, I guess the whole the whole life cycle of you know putting on a trade. Um, I think I do think that there are more parameters to keep in your mind when buying options and buying stocks. Obviously, um, so it's it's kind of like. It might be easy if you're not systematic about it to like forget certain risks that you're like not aware of. Um, and one thing is like, let's say like choosing your tenor. Like most, I don't know if most people have a good reason for choosing, you know, one month versus two versus three. Um, but if you're gonna play an event, you probably like, you know, and the event happens, let's say it's earnings and earnings are in two months. Um, you probably don't want to be overpaying by buying like a six month instead of a two month because your catalyst is already going to, you know, happen. Um, and that that's if you're obviously, uh, you know, going and playing that directionality. Um, 
and then strikes as well like there are definitely uh you know strikes that would be considered um like rich relative to historical versus like cheap relative to historical because uh you know as we all know the you know iv isn't constant across all the strikes and so if the shape of the volatility curve is flatter than usual or something then maybe you want to go more buy something more out of the money um etc you're talking you're talking skew yeah 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 okay so so um a few things so when you say iv that's implied volatility which is yep. basically you know how much the options market thinks things can move essentially also when you said that the thing about tenors that's when the options expires very important because options unlike stocks are path dependent if i think apple's at uh, 170 i think it's going to 300 dollars. if i buy the stock now and in in a year it's at 300 dollars, i made 130 dollars. but if i buy a two-month option and options and apple stays flat for two months I lose that entire thing, even if it eventually goes to to three hundred dollars. Ming, you said you, you sort of uh, back test whether volatility is rich or cheap. In particular, you've got you've got some great charts. I think you had a thread on Tesla uh, where you analyze what is the implied volatility of, of this Tesla option now, and how does it compare to a historical basis? And you know, let's say it's in the sixty eighth percentile, or it's in the twentieth percentile. Uh, how does that inform your trading? Are you more inclined to buy an option if the volatility is in the 20th percentile, i.e. low? More inclined to sell an option or sell a spread if it's if it's high? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the idea is, you know, obviously implied volatility is always going to be higher than historical volatility. Um, and that's because um, it, this has to do with the skew as well, but it has to do with uh, the fact that people want, you know, people want insurance. And so they want to they're willing to overpay for volatility ahead of time to protect a kind of a downside event. Um, and that's actually something that we haven't seen before the like the 19, uh, I think, like 87 crash or something. Uh, but a- ever since then, you know, we've had this um, this skew curve where the puts you know, out of the money are more expensive in their in- implied volatility than than at the money. Um, but basically the idea is like, hey, so uh, implied is always going to be higher than historical. Um, you know, the amount by which it's currently higher than like average historical, is that in the 20th percentile or in the 90th percentile, et cetera? Um, like, and then also uh, you kind of have to pair that with what you think about like the macro landscape and the the volatility regime in general. If you're like, hey, like, you know, we're just in an overall like, lower volatility environment then like it might make sense that you know iv is in the 30th 40th percentile instead of you know 70th 80th and so it's kind of the combination of hey like do i think like volatility in general is going to mean revert um and then what about like the volatility of this stock particular yeah imran how how do you go about knowing when Vol- implied volatility is cheap, but there's a reason it's cheap. So I'm actually not going to buy it versus, you know, implied volatility probably looked pretty expensive in January 20th of 2021 20, uh, for GameStop. But of course, it was vastly underpriced until what it was eventually become. Yeah. So so, I mean, yeah, the point being made other than just comparing um, implied vol to realized, which is basically called carry, right? It's like is this volatility carrying itself? Is it realizing as much as it needs to? And that's going to determine that where that implied vol goes, right? If, if, the, if the thing's realizing 10, but it's implied at 20, there's going to be limited appetite to buy this stuff from market makers because they just can't make back their theta. They can't make back their carry. So the implied vol is going to drift lower, right? You also need to be aware of where does implied vol trade in its range, right? Because as, as was said, it's mean reverting generally vol. So Tesla is a great example, right? Tesla vol before Tesla popped from 800 to 1200, Tesla vol was at around 30, 35. When we exploded higher, it went to 65. So if you're now bullish Tesla to go and buy a load of call options, given that the vol's doubled since a month, is quite dangerous because the implied vol is at astronomic levels, right? So you just need to be aware that when you're buying an option, you're not just buying the Delta Greeks of it, you're buying Vega Greeks as well. And those Vega Greeks are going to depend on what implieds do, right? And then the last thing to be aware of is positioning. So whereas, you know, you need to get a feel, and this is something Spot Gamma do really well and uh, who I partner with, right? And they, um, they monitor what option positioning looks like across 
or the single stocks or the indices and try to get an idea of what the gamma landscape looks like because dealers ultimately their behavior is quite predictable right if they're all sitting there long loads of gamma then that's going to suppress the volatility of a stock right if they're all short then that's going to probably mean the stock overshoots in both directions and wings around a lot so that will give you some tell on which way around maybe you want to be in that in that volatility space yeah, Nimra, I think that could be one of the more common mistakes that beginners with options make. Certainly, I've made it is when they have a, a delta view, but they only use options to express the delta view. They don't take into account how much they're paying for implied volatility. Certainly, a lot of retail traders have been overpaying for implied volatility ever since meme stock uh, madness hit, 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 hit us in, in January. Uh, what do you what do you guys think about the strategy of let's say I'm really bullish Berkshire Hathaway. I don't know if the implied vol is, you know, I, I'm not an expert like you, you both of you. I, I don't know if it's, you know, rich or cheap. What do you go about sort of eliminating the Vega exposure by buying a Berkshire call option, but then also selling a put option with a similar Vega? So I'm sort of volatility, volatility neutral. It's a risky business. <laughs> I mean, the problem is you're selling the put is you're taking downside risk, right? So. I mean, it, there's all there's different degrees of safety and riskiness when you're doing options, right? Obviously, just buying an option, paying the premium, and, and going to bed is a, is a lot less risky than doing something like you've just suggested. But you know, maybe a, a happy medium to that would be doing a call spread, where you buy a call and you sell a higher strike call, bring the cost down, bring the Vega exposure down, but at least you know your risk is still just I'm spending something. I'm trying to get a bit of leverage to the premium that I spend. But if the stock dumps, I'm not going to get into any, any pain, basically, right? So there's there's the whole spectrum of risk, and then you've got to figure out where you sit on that to some extent. Mm. And Imran, what would you say is the most common? You know, because you not only are you a veteran option trader yourself, you do a lot of work with beginner options traders who want to learn more about it. What are the most common mistakes you see where just someone like you or someone else with your experience would, uh, you know, never make do this, but you see a lot of people, retail traders, doing it. Probably the one that springs to mind is just going too short dated, right? So when you've got a view on a stock or an underlying, uh, this course one day, two day options offer you the best leverage, right? They're, they're going to be very, very seductive in the idea that if you're right, you spend such a small amount of money because it's a one day option or two day option. And if you get it right, it's going to multiply by 10. But that just doesn't happen very often, right? And it's a very, very binary outcome, right? The closer you are to expiry, the more binary the trade. It either, you either lose all the premium or you make loads, okay? And usually market makers are quite good at pricing things and, and what is the, the risk in this. So, so I just think systematically buying super short dated options over and over again to express your views is probably not the right way to go. And I think is is a common beginner mistake because that's the whole YOLO trade, right? Like you want to, you want to, it's the lottery ticket trade where you want to buy something and get a 10 bagger, 20 bagger, whatever it is, which makes you feel good, but it just doesn't happen very often, right? So I think over the long run, you're going to be better off structuring your views with slightly longer dated strategies that are not so binary. That, that would be my, that's what I tell a lot of beginners. Yeah, I think to add to that, um, another one that I've seen is basically exercising early uh, mm -hmm. and I think wow. and that's like a clear mistake because kind of beginner traders don't really understand that you know the value of the option comes from two kind of fundamental factors one is your your time value and the other one is the intrinsic value um, and not understanding time value basically means you know hey my option is in the money I'm gonna exercise it early but what about that time value? You basically threw it down the trash mm. versus the better thing to do is, hey, if I'm long, I can just sell the option and then recoup basically all of that time value by passing it on to the next person. Um, and so that's that's a common mistake I see. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware that people are still making that mistake. That's a cardinal, <laughs> that's a cardinal sin. That is, I mean, <laughs> you're just throwing money down the toilet, right? You. You can do the same trade is just sell the option. You don't need to exercise it. Someone's going to pay you more money than what you're going to get from exercising it, right? Like the alternative to, to exercise, say you got a call option, the alternative to exercising it early is to sell it out and buy the stock. It's the same trade. 
but you're not giving money away for free, right? So that's, yeah, that's that's a big one, big no-no. What, Imran, what about if the uh, stock option that you own is extremely illiquid, so you can't just, quote, sell it, or you could sell it, but it would be at much lower to the sort of theoretical value? Yeah, it's still better than writing off the time value to zero. We're literally saying, but by exercising early, you are writing off the time value at zero. You're saying it's got none, right? So I'm sure someone's going to give you some kind of bid for it. Right, even in a liquid market. Yeah, and another thing to note too is like, even if it's a, li- a liquid, you know, there's there's some price at which the market makers are willing to take the other side, right? Um, so when you send it off, you know, to your broker and it goes off to the market makers and they see that it's from a broker, like they, they will, you know, take the other side. Mm. Uh, when you guys ha- uh, put on an option position, how do you go about knowing when to sell it and knowing when to hold it. Let's start with the example where the option, the trade doesn't work out. And it, let's say you, you bought $2 worth of premium and it, it went down to $1.50. Do, do you typically, I know it's they're very dependent on a lot of variables, but do you typically want to exit options trades once they stop working? Or do you like to hold, you know, let them expire worthless essentially? Usually, you know, you would go into a trade and you would have kind of like, scenarios for yourself where you'd be like you know if it goes down 20 percent, what do i do and like if it goes down 50 percent, what do i do um and so you kind of like have those or, or i would set you know stop loss or that would be another advice for beginners it's like you know ahead of each trade like set different scenarios and kind of checkpoints and say like that way you're not you know because in the moment of things you're going to be emotional and you're going to be like oh no it went down 50 percent. i must hold like i must recoup like what i lost and like the market doesn't have to do what you want it to do and um you know it's better to kind of decide ahead of time when you're clear-headed and say like you know if it's clearly trending in the wrong direction once it hits a certain threshold i'm gonna sell to recuperate the time value and would you typically mean have that be automated in terms of a stop order or is it sort of just you get a ping and you execute it yourself manually yeah i'm not that fancy i'm just manual right now (laughs) yeah yeah Imran, what about you yeah you know i think it depends on the motivation of the trade right so obviously ming's mentioned a lot of trade motivation around speculation right you think a stock's gonna go up go down and you express an option view to express that view right but you know some people trade options to hedge their book Right. Some people trade options to earn income. Right. So if you're, if you're a call over writer and you're just selling calls, there's nothing to do. Right. There's no stop. You get taken out of your exposure if it rallies too much. And if you don't, you're going to earn the income. So there isn't any early cutting or anything. Right. On the hedging side, maybe it's a little bit more complicated. You might put, um, you might have a macro hedge on your book and it's getting a bit close to expiry and you're not convinced the put's going to work for you so you might roll it to a longer expiry when it gets within a few weeks of expiry or something like that when the decay is going to get really heavy on it or something like that but a lot of it depends on that um, initial motivation and sometimes you'll just be like well i already priced the idea that the premium of this option is just written off for me it's a bet i've sized it according to what i'm willing to lose put it down and it will be it will be alive until it expires. And therefore, my view will still be, you know, if the stock does what I think it's going to do by that expiry, I'll be OK. And I've made peace with the premium that I'm willing to put down. So there's a ton of different ways to approach it. Yeah. And you brought up rolling the contracts and people use that for a hedge because they want that constant exposure. When I buy a, a call option in January 2023, 20, my exposure from, via the options in terms of the Greek, Gamma, Delta, Vega, everything is much different now than it would be when 2023 happens. Because when 2023 happens, it's a one week option, you know? So how do you go about sort of deciding about whether to roll those contracts? Imran, you mentioned the hedging, but what about also if you just want to be systematically long SPY calls, long QQQ calls? You know, I know there are a lot of folks who buy a six month QQQ call, and then when it turns into a three month QQQ call, they sell it and then they buy another six month QQQ call. So sort of rolling that contract. Um, you know, uh, Ming, what do you think of sort of the advantages and disadvantages of that strategy? Yeah, I think, well, the, you can think of it like, hey, for example, like, do I buy a six month or do I buy one month six times? Kind of like those, those are the two extreme options. Um, well, I would say like the disadvantage of just buying like, you know, a six month straight is 
you're you're buying six months of the current ball regime so like whatever whatever price you go in at you're you're going in for the full six months and um you know if you do it kind of one month at a time you can get in at you know at different points it's kind of like dollar cost averaging almost you can think of um and that said like you know you could always as you say like swap out you know in in like couple months and um and so forth but but essentially you you kind of get more information if you like the longer you wait in the future the more you have information about the future right yeah like locking in a six month trade yeah this is what i say to a lot of my clients who are training portfolio hedging it's like is that all does that always make the most sense because like like ming said if you buy a one month option but you your hedging budget you split it into six clips in that first month, you buy a put, the market rallies 5%. The next put you're going to be buying next month is going to be struck with a much higher strike, basically, right? Whereas if you bought a six-month put originally, that strike is not moving up with the market. That strike was determined with the market lower down, and it's going to be much harder for the market to actually go through your strike and make you any money on that option as it's drifting higher, basically. So I think there's a lot of value in trading those short-term options. Um, and then, you know... The, the, the other stuff um, is you can be opportunistic about the curve, right? So something that I do a lot in crypto is trade this term structure, right? Which is the difference in vol between different maturities. And sometimes I'll be short calendars where I'll be owning short dated options and selling longer dated options against it because that's where the volatility opportunity is. And then the curve will move and it will make more sense to move out of the short dated options and into the long dated ones because the short dated vol is susceptible to collapsing and I don't want to be exposed to that, right? So once you start to understand all the different parameters are at play and all the risks involved, you can be opportunistic about where you position yourself on the term structure so that you don't take that much risk, basically. Yeah, so you're talking about the term structure. What is volatility priced out at different tenors? So, for example, the VIX, the, the CBO volatility index, that is an average of a 30-day volatility, implied volatility on the S&P 500. But there are, you know, there are 90 days. There, there's two years. There's one year. All sorts of different tenors. And when you take that tenor uh, 2D chart and you combine it with the skew chart that Ming was talking about earlier, that's when you get these very fancy 3D charts that uh, you know you can just get lost in looking at. Um, but but uh, Imran, be, I'm glad you brought up crypto options. This is something that you have been following very closely. You know, when I first met you about a year ago, you and I were talking about equity options. You taught me a ton. Then I started asking these questions, and you said, "Jack, I don't really, I don't, I, you know, the equity game is all the action is in crypto <laughs> options." Tell us about your 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 journey and you oh, know, why wow. you find them so alluring. Maybe first start about, you know, your, your macro view on crypto is bullish, but then I, I've heard you describe crypto options as a quote, dream. Why is that the case? Okay, so look, I traded equity options for 20 years and there are many periods where equities do not a lot and they're very, especially when you're an index trader, right? Index vol can get exceptionally low, right? I think the lows I've ever seen on S&P vol is like five or six. It's very boring at times, yeah? Um, and as a vol trader, and in index land, the only time vol gets exciting is when the market's crashing. So that's why we tend to do quite well in like 2008 type crisis events because suddenly index vol is where it's at. That's where the liquidity is. That's where the vol is. And, and you get to actually have a proper go. Um, and the thing about crypto is the vol's just at 100 or let's say in the range of 70 to 100 most of the time, which is a lot of fun to play around in because as I always say to my students is the best market to trade options in is a market where the asset moves around and the volatility of the asset also moves around. And when you, because you're so multidimensional and you can take positions on the spot, i.e. the Delta position or positions in Vega, i.e. the vol, that multidimensional trading in something where those parameters are winging around like animals becomes a lot of fun. Right. And that's, that's why. Yeah, and there's some features. Uh, Ming said starting after 1987, when you had a huge crash, tons of put skew in, in equities. In other words, to put a bearish options position on cost more, paying higher implied volatility than to put a bullish position on because when sort of shit hits the fan, uh, you know, you're paying for that protection. Imran, you found that, I don't know if this is still the case, but 
particularly last year, there was quote there was call skew in crypto because everyone was so you know out of their mind bullish. They were paying more for calls than they were for puts. Can you quickly walk people through how you use that market structure to your advantage to sort of hedge your crypto gains? So I probably go into crypto around summer 2020. Um, Bitcoin was around eight, 9,000 or something. Obviously it did well. It rallied to 40,000 by January 21. Um, and at that point, the acceleration that it had got a lot of people excited. A lot of retail money was chasing it. People were piling into call options. And the, the, the extreme implied volatility that call options were trading at was just insane, right? It was like 200 vol, which is outlandish, okay? And, um, and once you've made a load of money from 10K to 40K and people are paying 200 vol for like the seven, 70,000 calls expiring in two or three weeks, you can basically sell those calls, get a nice premium out of them and use that premium to buy put protection so that if that, that market that's now showing you a short term oversold, overbought RSI at 90 or something on the weekly and you think it's going to correct, then owning those puts is not a bad idea given that you've been long and and it's different you don't have to like make the call that market's topped out and it's over and it's and it's going to sell off because you've been long you're long for a reason you want to keep your longs but you don't mind getting taken out of some of those longs if it goes to 70,000 in another three weeks because that's just ridiculous right and you're laying that call off to then buy put protection that if you get the pullback you'll be able to monetize, monetize that put protection and then just go back to your position, which is long again after the market's pulled back and isn't, isn't so frothy, basically. So that's called a risk reversal, a very common protection strategy done uh, across all markets, but it looked particularly attractive when, um, when the call skew is, is where the premium is. And you definitely see that in commodity markets a lot of the time. And we certainly saw that in crypto markets earlier last year. Yeah. And so you, you use that to hedge your Bitcoin position, which you already had. You, you, if you didn't have a Bitcoin position, you would have been selling a naked call against Bitcoin, which uh, I recommend to viewers to not do unless you're an expert. Unless you sold a naked call on a stock, don't sell a naked call on crypto. Selling naked calls can be super dangerous and it's certainly not something you want, you want, to, you want to do without knowing what you're getting into and being very careful about your sizing. That doesn't mean you can't do it. You just got to know what you're getting into, right? So like selling naked calls on GameStop, for example, a dangerous game, clearly, right? So um, as many have learned. Yeah. yeah. So, so Ming, Imran is deep in the crypto options, options world. He's sort of living in it. What has your been experience with that? You know, I know, I know you've been observing it. Uh, you, do you know any uh, similarities, differences between crypto options and and, and the, the equity options? Are you, are you seeing opportunities there? Are you th seeing some risks? How are you sort of thinking about this? Yeah, so uh, the way I see it is I actually think there's three groups. So there's like CeFi crypto and there's TradFi and there's DeFi crypto. Um, and we're definitely seeing like in the last year, I think we've seen, you know, options crypto options volume was like 3x in the last two years like traditional finance equity options have been 4x in the last two years um you know definitely an overall across the board interest uh rise in interest in options um uh, i think you know there's about maybe like 1 billion total traded volume in like bitcoin and eth options uh daily and that number is, you know, obviously it fluctuates, but I think it's obviously going up over time. Um, and about like 95% of the volume happens on Deribit. And so that's something that's super interesting. I think um, kind of like maybe we're just really early in DeFi. Like why, why does Deribit have 95% of the volume? Um, and I think it's, it's also a bit harder, you know, because I can't really trade crypto options being in the US and all. Um, so, you know, not doing it firsthand definitely puts a damper to like really getting in the weeds of things. But um, but from the way that I see it, you know, you just you have this huge the market is definitely like there's a ceiling. There, there's an artificial ceiling due to regulations, due to U.S. traders not being allowed to trade crypto options. Um, and and then I think DeFi is also kind of just starting to pick up in their interest in in options, both from the developer standpoint, um, as well as the trading standpoint. 
Um, and I think like one big problem uh, that we see, you know, and, and this is kind of, this goes into why I think, you know, options, they, they kind of really do need like a Solana type of, uh, of environment to, to really make it possible. Um, and that's because of liquidation. So the idea is like, hey, in traditional finance, when, uh, let's say when, when you are naked, sure, or uh, either a put or a call, like, um, and you can, the, the position can go against you in, indefinitely, um, you know, you have to put up margin and who who's to blame when, you know, the market moves so fast that your, your mar- it blows past your margin and suddenly you're, you know, who's going to take that fall? And in traditional finance, we have layers of defense, basically, where like first your your broker takes a fall and then the exchanges and the exchanges basically take a fall if the brokers default. And then you have the clearing houses and the clearing houses take the take the liability if the exchanges default. And so at each layer down, the overall like the systemic whether there will be a systemic market impact is like very, very, very low because you have all these players that will be next line of defense. Right. Um, and which is like something that you just don't see in in crypto, obviously, because because of the whole decentralization movement, because there's there's no clearing houses. Um, and so then the question becomes what like we need to figure out what happened in a liquidation event ahead of time. And I think that's probably why, um, you know, innovation in the option space has waited for so long in DeFi um, is because, you know, developers and and everyone has been trying to figure out like a way around those liquidation events um and then that's also where you know if you don't have a very fast oracle if you have an oracle that updates price um you know every hour how much can a stock move or how much can you know bitcoin eth sol any of these dogecoin move in an hour like it can move a lot and so um, you know, you we really do need to have those very fast updating um, data feeds to support, you know, liquidation. And so I think that's where, um, you know, obviously Python Solana has been that solution. Um, and so I think now it's possible to develop, you know, more robust uh, options trading solutions in DeFi. The DOVs, right? The rise of the DOVs, these DeFi option vaults, they... They seem to have exploded in the last sort of six months. I think the numbers are something like a hundred, a hundred million to seven hundred million dollars locked up in those vaults. And basically, what they essentially are is like a, a wrapper where you stick your crypto in there, and they do a systematic vol selling strategy, whether it's covered call writing or 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 you stick a stable coin in there, and they and they do put selling for you, and you get delivered. You get converted from a stable coin into a crypto at a certain strike price. So I think the way they're kind of doing it is they're offering these fully collateralized retail options for trading. They'll take the they'll take the maintenance of that strategy away from you, but you have to park your your full collateral in that vault. So that takes care of the liquidation risk, right? That's for the covered, yeah, that's for the covered call selling strategy. And then there's like the yeah. naked put selling strategy, which obviously doesn't have a, a fully collateralized, you know, but parallel. Do you, not have to, do you not have to put a full amount of uh, stable coin collateral in there with the puts that you're selling? Because that would make sense, right? Then it'd be covered. Imran, I think I get what you're saying is that because if you, if you sell a naked put, but the value of your quote account, like your, your losses are capped by the stock going to zero. So, you know, a put... Struck at a hundred is is it ten thousand dollars, right? So yeah, as long as you've got the money to take delivery of the coin at the strike price, uh, which you know generally when people trade options, they don't have they trade a size of options that is a lot bigger, and they can't take delivery of that asset at that strike price, which is why they have to post margin and they've got liquidation risk. But if you literally, you know, you stick a hundred grand worth of stable coin in an account and you only sell the number of puts that will purchase that much crypto at that price, nothing else to do, right? And I think sure. the smart contracts can kind of take care of that for you. Um, and I think QCP put out a good piece about this, explaining, you know, DeFi options and stuff. And they're saying that actually DeFi options are kind of driving the uh, adoption into altcoin options, right? Obviously you've got massive liquid market on Deribit with Ethereum and Bitcoin options, 
altcoins haven't had quite as much activity. Market makers haven't been quite as willing to play in that space. But with the rise of these vaults, because they are fully collateralized and people are just parking their altcoins in there, that's kind of now driving activity and, and is empowering market makers to offer liquidity in that space. And, and it's a bit weird. It's like the other way around. Normally you have it the other way where the DeFi options will come later, but they, they seem to be um, going first. Yeah, it's incredible. Imran, I remember I asked you in the summer of 2021, oh, do they have options on Dogecoin? Do they have options on, on Cardano or, the, or sort of these things? And you said no on Darabit, but it's just in such a short amount of time, it seems like this entire ecosystem has just bloomed. Uh, Imran, what do you think about the selling of volatility that is, do you think that's causing the uh, uh, compression in implied volatility, uh, all these strategies, because you know, in the traditional world, in the same way, people have been selling volatility. That's why the VIX was at five or six in 2016, 2017. Do you think that's why you've seen implied volatilities for crypto options drift lower? And we can put a chart. Yeah, I, I think the the vaults has been a huge thing. I think it's been a combination of realized vol collapsing into year end, and, and crypto kind of not delivering the year end rally that everyone was set up for, and then you know breaking down supports, but not completely falling out of bed, finding some stability. Um, so realize just realize just coming lower through seasonality, let's say, as long with the fact that all these market makers have been given a load of volatility via these vaults that are selling on both sides of the of the strike. Um, they have to they have to lay that off somewhere, right? They have to sell volatility somewhere. If they're, if they're sitting on a load of Solana options that there's no liquid market to get rid of, what are they going to sell? They're going to sell Ethereum options to get some theta back because there's correlation between the assets. So they just need to sell vol where they can. It's like a similar situation to, I used to trade European index vol. And if I had to trade a load of DAX and FTSE vol, and there wasn't that much liquidity, I would go and sell the liquid index, which was the Eurostox or the S&P to lay off that volatility so I could manage my theta on my book. I think that's exactly what's happening in crypto. And I think that explains a lot why we've seen this this massive move in crypto vol over the last month. And do you think that creates opportunity? Uh, when vol was so high, you were inclined to sell it. Now that vol is so low, you inclined to buy it? Yeah, but I think the problem with buying it is just, just buying it and trading the gamma of it is not that likely to be a profitable trade, right? Because the reason it's going down is because people are long it and they need to get rid of it. So, so you kind of need a catalyst, right? If you see a catalyst for a move, then it can make sense to express that move via short dated options because the vol is actually now not so expensive and you can get some reasonable leverage to your premium if your view is correct. It's just that crypto is in this spot, weird spot where it's really crying for a catalyst and there, there really isn't one right now. Uh, when that changes, you'll probably see people rush back into short dated options because they will look quite good value compared to where they've been historically. Um, but right now, it's not it's not no brainer. I don't think to buy short dated vol. Right, you can't be bullish the DOVs and be buying short dated options, right? Yeah, exactly. If that flow goes from seven hundred million to like three billion, like crypto exponential curves do that, right? You look at what the NFT adoption, what happened in the NFTs. If that type of thing happens in DOVs, that's a massive supply of Vega that's going to hit the street, right? So, well, sure. yeah, so yeah, it will cause implied volatility to go even lower. So because exactly. DOVs are sh shorting volatility. And what do you what do you both of you, what do you guys think that does on the price? If we had three billion uh, or, or a very large amount of Vega that you just talked about is being sold via DOVs, even larger than it is now, implied volatility is crushed. What does that do to the spot price of Bitcoin, Ethereum and these these alts? Uh, Ming, how about you go first? Yeah, sure. It's essentially the opposite of what happened in, you know, the GME gamma squeeze. So in this case, if it, if there's massive buy side interest in selling vol and now, you know, market makers are forced to, to buy, um, then, you know, if there's a rally, they're going to be selling. And so rather than this reflexive loop going up and up and up, there's kind of they, they counteract each other. Um, so like when there's a rally, market makers are going to sell the opposite. They're going to buy, et cetera. And so. Um, there's there's a much more kind of conversion towards the like mean reversion basically happening, uh, or at least a lot of market forces systematically put in place to mean revert. And so when you mean revert, that basically causes implied volatility to go even lower. And so you can you can say there's basically a spiral effect in 
sending implied volatilities lower and lower. Um, and, uh, and, you know, until it's at a certain point, it gets so low and something has to happen. Yeah, I would tend to agree. It's going to, whilst, whilst it's going to suppress implied, it's probably going to keep a lid on the market. It's going to make it hard for the market to rally. And you look at the correlation between Bitcoin and its volatility is typically more to the downside, right? So when, when Bitcoin volatility is going up, usually Bitcoin price is going up as well. When Bitcoin volatility is going down, it's, it's kind of drifting lower as well. So I think that, is, and I also think, and this is something I just kind of thought of, is that imagine you're a market maker who takes down a load of vault, some of this vault gamma basically, right? So you're effectively long with this altcoin gamma all this volatility slightly upside, let's say, on the altcoins, okay? And there's no liquidity to dump that gamma. So you're gonna to have to sell Ethereum and Bitcoin vol, right? So that's gonna that's gonna basically flood the street. And when I say the street, I mean all the market makers, it's gonna flood them with gamma in Bitcoin and Ethereum. But you're the guy who's just sitting there long a load of altcoin gamma against your short large cap gamma, right? So whilst the stuff that you've sold out is gonna cap Bitcoin and Ethereum in any kind of rally, you actually want the altcoins to rally, right? So you might have this case where that, that dynamic, as it grows, you find that you have Bitcoin and Ethereum actually struggling to perform, but the alts just massively outperform on the upside because they don't have, they don't necessarily have the gamma overhang because the guys who are sitting on it are actually playing that to try and be long those alts relative to the large caps and benefit from that, right? Well, and they're not dispersing all of their gamma across the street so that everyone's like, you know, jumping over themselves to sell it on any rally like they will be in Ethereum and Bitcoin. So I think you might see that play out. In late cycles of crypto, you typically see the altcoins all performing. Of course, in the very, very late cycles, the end of cycles, obviously that, that's the reverse if there's a huge crash. But you're saying that there would actually be a technical market structure catalyst for that. Uh, I don't, I'm not gonna pretend to understand that, that right now, but that, that, that's very interesting. Um, Imran Ming, it's been great having you on Forward Guidance. I recommend everyone um, to follow you both on Twitter. Uh, Imran, you are under, at options underscore insight. Uh, Ming, you are at Fabius Mercurius. Uh, my closing question for you both is, we've had an explosive sell-off in not only bonds, but also speculative growth stocks, uh, uh, you know, high, high valuation growth stocks to start off the week. We're filming on Friday, January 7th. How are you thinking about playing that given all this sort of option stuff that we talked about? If people viewing this are thinking, hmm, it might be actually a wise decision to, to buy a put option on, on everything that just went down. Is that instinct right, wrong? Do people have to do a lot of thinking before they sort of follow their instinct? Yeah, I'll start with a safe harbor, not investment advice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, kind of, you know, be beware, uh, you know, look at look at all the signals, whether if you think, you know, things are oversold right now, if you think, you know, IV is too high, um, because because things are under uh, things are selling off, then um, and you think, you know, let's say you have a macro view on the Fed and Powell being, you know, next month being like, JK, we're, you know, we're not going to taper this soon, we're gonna, you know, keep printing money, then like, you know, maybe you should express that view um or like if you think you know this is a period of great uncertainty and it's just makes sense to just sit out like no problem with that right like you should only swing at the things that you have high confidence in um i'm not really sure how to answer this whether i should just to give my macro view or options or what but i'll, I'll, ju I'll just quickly try and do it as quickly as i can i think the arc stuff has been beaten up obviously on the back of the rates move I think it's a bit overdone. If you look at some technical indicators, there's some bullish divergences popping up. The volatility is not spiking as much as it was on the first leg down in ARC as well, which is a volatility divergence. So that often signals a short term bounce is coming in some of those names. And, you know, it's very well telegraphed now, right? I mean, we're pricing in probably four hikes for next for this year or close to. So I don't know how much worse the hikes are going to get priced in in the very short term. Right. Obviously, the FOMC was kind of a marginal hawkish dynamic. Um, but, you know, if you if you follow some of the, the good macro guys out there like Darius Dale, you know, we're, we're probably going to get some kind of deflation type dynamic later in Q1, Q2. And that's probably quite good for bonds. Right. 
so I, I'm actually long some TLT calls. I was long some TLT call spreads, which is like the 20 year treasury bond. I'm covering or putting some bids in to cover my higher strike. So I'm just going to lean a little bit long calls on TLT as a way of having some deflation regime exposure should we get that move into uh, Q1, which I think we probably will. Mm, <laughs> brilliant. Um, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Imran Ming, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Cheers, Jack.